Before the Dark Knight trilogy and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, 20th Century Fox's adaptations of Marvel's X-Men series helped revive the comic book superhero movie blockbuster. With the addition of Logan, there are now 10 movies in the franchise. From worst to best, let's rank them. And beware, spoilers herein. At number 10, X-Men Origins Wolverine. This may be the only genuinely bad movie on this list. Although it's passable as popcorn fare, it did make Fox plenty of money at the box office after all. It's incredibly flawed when you think about it. The consensus of generally negative critical reviews led Fox to cancel any plans to make other standalone Origins movies of the other X-Men characters. The movie contradicts or otherwise confuses elements in the rest of the series. And this was years before the introduction of time travel in Days of Future Past threw the timeline into chaos. One of those contradictions, however, is one of the brighter points in the movie. That is, Leif Schreiber is menacing as Sabretooth, no longer the dumb henchman he was in the first X-Men film. Origin starts out well by establishing the brotherly relationship between Wolverine and Sabretooth. There's a promising montage of them fighting in American wars from the Civil War to Vietnam, and the eventual rift between the two is convincing and engaging. But otherwise, the movie is largely rubbish. There's a predictable and cliche-ridden romance. The CGI at times is really bad, and the action scenes are far too cartoonish. Even when the action is pretty cool to watch, it doesn't logically make much sense. And the host of periphery X-Men characters, including the other members of Team X and Gambit, mostly suck. What they do to Deadpool especially is an abomination. Fortunately, Deadpool, with Ryan Reynolds reprising the role, was done right seven years later. Also, what kind of dig at DC is it to kill the nice elderly Ma and Pa Kent? At number 9, X-Men Apocalypse. The latest and most disappointing entry in the franchise to feature the entire X-Men gang, Apocalypse suffers from a few of the same problems that Origins and some of the other movies do. A lot of time is spent to set up future movies by introducing or developing a host of supporting mutant characters that are hit and miss. Quicksilver has daddy issues, but he does deliver another great scene. Storm is Egyptian now which doesn't line at all with Halle Berry's very American portrayal of her. Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique basically reprises her role as the Mockingjay in the Hunger Games movies as a heroic symbol for the oppressed. Games of Thrones star Sophie Turner is good as Jean Grey. Hugh Jackman gets to steal the show again too, with only one great scene. Nevertheless, despite mutants seemingly finally finding some acceptance and appreciation among mankind in the story, Many of the mutants remain as moody as ever, and others double down on continuing to make themselves appear menacing once again as the world faces, well, Apocalypse. Which leads us to possibly the most fatal flaw of the movie, the titular villain Apocalypse. The oldest mutant introduced in the movie series, Apocalypse enters the scene in 3600 BC, ruling a prehistoric Egypt that looks much more like Old Kingdom Egypt of a thousand or so years later. You know, the actual era of pyramids and hieroglyphs. It's implied that this prehistoric god mutant taught man how to build pyramids and maybe other stuff. Or the Bible got it from him. Right. Seems unlikely given he has been absent from 3600 BC until he's awakened in the 1980s AD. Make him a space alien? Then he's basically an ancient astronaut, a la the pseudo-history found in Chariots of the Gods or the A History Channel or Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. They all seem to enjoy destroying priceless works of humanity, at least. At number 8, The Wolverine. From around the number 8 to number 4 spots are where the movies in this ranking become somewhat interchangeable for us. They're all above average superhero movies, not quite in the top tier, but they mostly overcome their flaws. The Wolverine is Sen Japan, which was a welcome change of perspective to the Anglo-oriented X-Men series, and it's appropriate given the connection between the Atomic Age and the rise of mutants made in the series' prior installment, First Class. Although that doesn't explain Wolverine, who was born in British Canada in the 19th century, let alone the later aforementioned Apocalypse. But I digress. Although the climax is cartoonish and CGI heavy, as others have criticized, this is certainly an improvement upon the first Wolverine movie. Wolverine becomes more vulnerable, and thus compelling both physically and emotionally this outing. And, even though the movie is full of scenes where characters speak Japanese without subtitles, it remains more comprehensible than Origins too, even to non-Japanese and English bilingual speakers. At number 7, X2, X-Men United. 
The first X-Men set up the conflict between man and mutant over registry as a parallel to Nazism and the Holocaust with a scene from Magneto's past. This time the movie's themes of civil war between man and mutant, political assassination and slavery via Stryker's mind control scheme, and martyrdom are introduced at the beginning by a White House tour guide's examination of President Lincoln's portrait. Although this sequel is quite good, and indeed others have ranked it much higher than we have, we rank it lower than the original film because it comes off a bit more heavy-handed, especially the love triangle between Wolverine, Jean Grey, and Cyclops. And I get it, the teenager rogue is sad that she can't touch her boyfriend. X2 would have been better too had Wolverine and Mystique consummated their relationship. At number 6, X-Men First Class X-Men The Next Generation slash prequel is a good update to a series that in some respects seemed to be losing some gas, especially after the negative critical reviews for The Last Stand and Origins. James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence, and others do well in heading the new cast, although Hugh Jackman still steals the show with his only line in the movie. Go fuck yourself. January Jones as Emma Frost is also introduced as a seemingly central figure in the prequel series, but she's been absent in the subsequent two movies. Otherwise in this one, the Cuban Missile Crisis serves to examine the beginnings of the conflicts between man and mutant, and the emergence of deferring mutant clans. The real world Cold War becomes a reference for a Cold War among man and mutant. At number 5, X-Men. What's not to like about a good assembling of superheroes movie? Reviewing the series, I was especially struck by the slower pace of the action in this film compared to subsequent superhero and action movies. However, I think the relatively slower pace is a plus. Moreover, the political bent of the original trilogy, as mutants fight for their civil rights, is intriguing. X-Men introduced audiences to the series and launched the star of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Unfortunately, not all of the superheroes are as interesting as him. Also called Cyclops. For instance, as Storm, Halle Berry, one of at least three Oscar winners in the cast, is rather boring in the first two movies. The youngest Oscar winner, Anna Paquin as Rogue, plays a central role in this original entry, which nicely underscores, along with other teenage characters and the mutant school setting, the puberty allegory of the mutants. It's certainly better than the bathroom scene in Origins. <laughs> You're right in there. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh. <sighs> Get it? His newfound bigger, harder, erect claws are a metaphor. In the next two movies, however, Rogue becomes another fringe character. Sabretooth is a mute bumbler of this outing, and then disappears from the series until being recast in Origins. Perhaps the Brotherhood fired him for his complete inability to capture any fellow mutants. Yet... The rivalry between English actors Patrick Stewart as Professor X and Ian McKellen as Magneto is great, and they perfectly set up the sequel at the end of this film. At number 4, X-Men, The Last Stand Okay, hear us out. We realize that The Last Stand isn't exactly high on many people's lists, but the action and visual effects were definitely turned up for the third installment, and the political situation, this time involving a mutant cure, is escalated by introducing the equivalent of the A-bomb via the nearly unlimited powers of Phoenix. Also, Fomke Jansen as Phoenix and Halle Berry as Storm are more interesting this time around, albeit perhaps because the X-Men and Brotherhood top ranks are decimated by essentially three main characters being killed off and two others losing their powers. On the negative side, the focus on action and CGI, along with the introduction of a multitude of supporting characters and bit parts, some of them being particularly regrettable, but hey, Kelsey Grammer is good as Beast, does leave less room in the way of character development and introspection. Nonetheless, The Last Stand does offer quite a few compelling character arcs and semi-conclusions. At number 3, X-Men, Days of Future Past. How do you improve upon a series that includes an older trilogy of good superhero movies, old enough where we're beginning to feel nostalgic, but not so old that the actors couldn't reprise their roles, and a fresh prequel, First Class, which in some ways approved upon that original trilogy. Combine them in a time-traveling Doc Brown space-time continuum Star Trek Generation slash Star Trek reboot conundrum, of course. So what if it reduces the original trilogy to a little more than a shared dream we had with Logan? Also, 
Quicksilver has a fantastic scene, which mostly makes up for the magic bullet nonsense that necessitated Magneto's prison break to begin with. On its own terms, Days of Future Past is a notch above any of the other X-Men movies to feature the entire cast of mutants, but it might have shaken up the series a bit too much. If Apocalypse is any indication, it's hard to see where the series can improve from here. At number 2, Logan. If this is Hugh Jackman's last Wolverine movie, as he stated, as well as Patrick Stewart's final portrayal of Professor X, then it's a great conclusion. This is Jackman's greatest performance of his career thus far. The addition of cursing and graphic violence allowed by the movie's R rating helps a lot. The result is the most high-minded, serious addition to the franchise, and an almost unrelentingly depressing one about aging and mortality to boot. Action junkies won't be disappointed either, as the movie features the best scene ever of Wolverine going completely berserk. The dystopian future of Logan is presented as a western. Self-reflexively, a scene featuring the film Shane hints at this. It's the strongest movie in the series visually as well, with good cinematography and nice touches in the production design that recall moments from prior movies in the series. Logan also features the X-Men comic books within the movie universe, and the plot of the movie turns on the conflict between the fiction-based hope and the harsh reality of mutant extinction and weaponization. And finally, at number 1, Deadpool. We went back and forth between Deadpool and Logan for the top two spots of this ranking, but we're going to give the edge to the movie that established the viability of the R-rated superhero movie. Who knows how Logan would have turned out if it weren't for the success of Deadpool. This is also the movie most unlike the rest in the series. It's an irreverent, self-referential, fourth wall breaking, R-rated black comedy and self-parody. <sighs> fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. That's like 16 walls. But it's also one of the best superhero movies ever made. Criticisms that the narrative is sometimes formulaic are beside the point. And having been in a few bad comic book movies himself, Green Lantern, Blade Trinity, and the movie at the bottom of this ranking, Ryan Reynolds is perfect this time around. Thanks for watching. We'd like to see your rankings and thoughts on the X-Men movies in the comments below, and please like and subscribe. You're still here. It's over. Go home.